Welcome everybody to the Liturgy of the Chalice. Today is our last segment or our last part of a series of talks about the Gospel of Philip that we've been giving for the past few months. So please go back and listen to all of our talks of this 12-part series on Facebook or on YouTube. <clears throat> I've chosen a few verses to conclude our discussion on. It's been really such an honor and divine privilege to talk about this sacred gnosis that is encapsulated in the Gospel of Philip. Again, the Gospel of Philip is considered to be a Gnostic Gospel. It is passed down through the Valentinian Gnosis, that school of Gnostical thought passed down it is said from St. Paul to Thutis, and from Thutis, Paul's direct disciple, to Valentinus. <clears throat> of course, at a certain point, uh, these teachings were deemed heretical by the Orthodox Church. And we can see why, if you look back on the different classes that we've had, the different talks in the Gospel of Philip, it's clear that this is a different, that although they revered Jesus, in his death and resurrection and his teachings, they had a very different idea on what the sacraments were about, what they meant, and even what resurrection was. Because it's said in the Gospel of Philip that you have to experience the resurrection before you die, which is something quite different from Christian orthodoxy. So let's conclude with the final verses. <clears throat> Ignorance is the mother of evil. Ignorance is the mother of all evil. Ignorance leads to death because those who come from ignorance neither were, nor are, nor will be. But those in the truth will be perfect when all truth is revealed. For truth is like ignorance. While hidden, Truth rests in itself, but when revealed and recognized, truth is praised in that it is stronger than ignorance and error. It gives freedom. The Word says, if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. Ignorance is a slave. Knowledge is freedom. If we know the truth, we shall find the fruit of truth within us. If we join with it, it will bring us fulfillment. So these are literally the near to the end of the Gospel of Philip. So these are among the last verses from the Gospel of Philip where the author or authors are trying to encourage us to do something with our lives. Most of humanity is in the grasp of ignorance, and we're slaves to ignorance. This is just true. We go about our life without any real direction. We're ignorant of the immortal part of us. We're ignorant of our relationship with God. We think God is somehow far away from us, but yet God is in every molecule of space. The smallest particle that science can identify, or ever will identify, is full of the Holy Spirit. There is nowhere where God is not, but yet we're ignorant of this. And until we realize that God is in every molecule, every cell of these bodies that we have, and it's behind every thought, every emotion, every action that we do. Until then, until we realize that God is the only thing there is, that we all emanated forth from that, then we will be in ignorance. And it's ignorance which causes us to sin. Sin sounds like a heavy word, but honestly, all that sin is is a mistake. A sin is a mistake, and don't we all make mistakes every day? When you say the word sin, 
sound so heavy, right? But sin is only a mistake. The Hebrew word is hata, which simply means to miss the mark. The mark that we're missing is identifying and having union with God consciousness that's within us. So there are two paths to take. The path of life and the path of death. And that sounds heavy too. And it is heavy, but it's not what it sounds like. They say that the, the result of sin is death, or the merit of sin is death. I believe it was Paul that said that in his epistles. And they don't mean that when you sin or make a mistake, you should be put to death. The, the natural conclusion to constant, mindless, ignorant sinning is spiritual death. A lack of spiritual understanding, a lack of gnosis, a lack of illumination, a lack of perfection or wholeness within us. And until we transcend ignorance, we were never illuminated, we are not currently illuminated, nor will we ever be illuminated or perfect until we eradicate ignorance. We have to pull it up from its roots. Ignorance and truth both have a veiled factor, right? Ignorance veils our spiritual eyes to spiritual truth. It causes us to act in ways that take us away from union with God instead of toward union with God. Truth is hidden behind ignorance. So that's what the writer meant whenever it said, for truth is like ignorance. Truth is hidden, ignorance hides. So this idea of hiding or being hidden is how they are alike. Because truth is what frees us. So while hidden, while veiled by ignorance, truth rests in itself. It's always within us and all around us. In fact, in every molecule of space, God or truth exists. But when truth is revealed and recognized, it is to be praised because it is stronger than ignorance. It shatters ignorance and wipes away every error. And it gives freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from what? It gives freedom from our own self-imposed wrong thoughts, wrong words, and wrong actions that bind us to attachment and aversion. And attachment and aversion is what creates suffering. Attachment and aversion is what ignorance is made of. The only thing we should be attached to is God alone. For that is the one permanent. And that is the truth. If you know the truth, the truth will make you free. And the truth is God alone. God alone is. There is nothing but God. God is one, and we are part of that one. The truth will set you free. This is found in John 8, 32. John is considered a very Gnostic-flavored gospel. And the Gnostic Christians revered John, as well as Paul, for their Gnostical verses. For their, they just interpreted the verses of Paul and John very differently than Orthodox Christianity does. So ignorance makes one a slave and knowledge makes us free. Free to be one with God. If we know the truth, we shall find the fruit of truth within us. God is within our hearts. Truth is in our hearts. If we join with it, it will bring us fulfillment.
It will fulfill all desires and beyond any desire we can think of. Add up all the desires, all the joys, all the pleasures of the world, and it's not even an iota of the joy that oneness with God brings. You literally can feel God's joy vibrating ecstatically in every cell of your body. It's an amazing experience. And that experience is not guarded by a priesthood. It's within you. Free yourself. Yes, we meet to worship God every Sunday together. We have the Eucharist together. We give thanks to God and return grace to God. And that's how truth becomes manifested when we return grace. God's grace is always flowing on us. It's always showering on us. It's in every breath that we take. People are like, why can't God just give me his grace? If God didn't give you his grace, you couldn't breathe right now. Trust me, you have God's grace, but you have to recognize it. Grace is given freely, with pure love, unconditionally. And the only way that we become qualified to experience truth, God, to become one with God, to experience Gnosis. The only way is by returning grace. How do we return grace? By paying it forward. Imitati Dei. Imitate God. If God gives his grace, his kindness, his compassion, his mercy, freely, lovingly, unconditionally, that is exactly what he expects you to do. And until that is our every moment, we will not experience truth. For as long as we act from the ego, we are in darkness and ignorance. But when we return grace for grace, truth will be revealed. It must. Things visible and hidden. At present, we encounter the visible things of creation, and we say that they are mighty and worthy, and the hidden things are weak and insignificant. It is not so with the visible things of truth. They are weak and insignificant, but the hidden things are mighty and worthy. To the right here we see different realms, from material realm up to higher spiritual realms, in Hermeticism. And early on in Christianity, Hermes was revered. He was one of the only pagan, so to speak, I hate the word, it's so silly. He was the only pagan being that was revered by the Catholic Church for a long time. For a long time. The teachings of Hermes were considered sacred in the church until one day they were deemed heretical. But the ideas of Hermes, of having different levels of spiritual realities, is also reflected in Judaism with the different polemi, or spiritual realities, or spiritual eons, that are discussed in Gnosticism, Christian Gnosticism. So at present we encounter visible things of creation, and we say that they are mighty and worthy, and hidden things are weak and insignificant. So this is the state of most of humanity. We only accept what we can see, because what we can see is what is real. It's what's mighty, it's what's worthy. And we forget that there are higher spiritual realms because we can't see it. I was on Facebook the other day, which gets me into trouble, and uh, <laughs> that, there is some, something about Jesus online, and I, I, I responded back as kindly as I could. 
And the person, one person wrote back, you know, well, how do we even know that Jesus existed? How do we even know that there's a heaven? And you know, it's a good question, right? I, I don't feel like this man was being disrespectful either. I think he was just asking a question. And my response to that was, you know, if you're, if you're asking this question respectively and not just trying to be divisive, like many people are nowadays, unfortunately, I said, if you're asking this question honestly and you want to explore the contents of the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Testament, just look at the historical teachings of Jesus and try and do it and see how you change. See how you become more positive, how people around you become more positive because of your influence by doing Jesus' teachings. Turn the other cheek. If you have something against your brother, leave your offering at the altar, go make up with your brother, and then come back. Forgive them for they know not what they do. Any of his teachings will lead us to joy. And there is nothing that lacks spiritual truth that can change you. Nothing. If these teachings are real, they come from a great being. Right? And honestly, we're told that there are nine planets, right? There's Uranus, there's Venus, there's Jupiter. Have I ever been to those places? Have I ever seen them? They're invisible to my eye. I can't see Uranus. I can't see Neptune. I can't see Pluto with my bare eyes looking at the sky. But do I believe that they're there because somebody has told me? So somebody with stronger vision telescopes has told me that there is a Pluto, there is a Neptune, there is a Uranus out there, and I believe him. So why wouldn't we believe that Maria Yeshua existed and that he taught these things? People with spiritual eyes to see and hear. They've told us it's true. There have been real living saints afterwards that have experienced it and have affirmed that if you do these things, it leads to truth, it leads to union. So believe me, Jesus says, the earth and the heavens shall pass away, but my word will not pass away. What he meant was that the day sky, the sky with the sun, and the night sky, which has the moon and the stars, that will eventually be dissolved. This earth will eventually dissolve billions of years from now. At some point, everything created will dissolve. Nothing material lasts forever. But the realms that are beyond the day and night sky that's just two olamim. In the Isaiah scheme, there are seven olamim, which means that there are five more that are eternal. In the Enochian scheme, there are eight more olamim that are eternal. These are very powerful realities with heavenly eternities and angels and different kinds of divine, spiritual, or infernal beings live in these spheres. They are eternal. God's throne, poetically, is in the highest of the Olami. And these invisible places, invisible to our eyes, are much more powerful than the visible things that humanity praises so much. So, people tend to think that all that I can see is all that matters, and what is hidden doesn't matter. And it's the same thing with spiritual truth. So many people this day say, say that the Bible is just made up. The Bhagavad Gita is just made up. The Ramayana is just made up. This is just made up. It's all made up. That's because they're too lazy to explore it. Because anybody that sincerely explores and tries to pray 
tries to meditate, God will give you a glimpse. He will let you know what is invisible is very real, very powerful, very transformative. And at that point, you realize that everything that is visible, all the brute, gross vibrations of outer speech, outer thoughts, outer emotions, the world, it's all totally insignificant in comparison with what God reveals in prayer and meditation. And if he's given me a glimpse, he can give you the whole show. Trust me. I'm nothing special. So always seek the higher. Remember, what we can see is very low vibration scientifically, right? We know from quantum physics that higher energies move at a very higher vibration. And thus, the, the faster something moves, the less we can see it with our eyes or hear it with our ears, etc. Doesn't this tell us, doesn't science tell us then, that the invisible is much more powerful than the visible? So quantum physics supports these verses of the Gospel of Philip. And our final verse on eternal light. <clears throat> Everyone who enters the bedchamber will kindle the light. This is like marriages that occur in secret and take place at night. The light of the fire shines during the night and then goes out. The mysteries of that marriage, however, are performed in the day and the light and neither that day nor its light ever sets. If someone becomes an attendant of the bridal chamber, that person will receive the light. If one does not receive it while here in this place, one cannot receive it in the other place. Those who receive the light cannot be seen or grasped. Nothing can trouble such people, even while they are living in this world. And when they leave this world, they have already received through truth images, and the world has become the eternal realm. To these people, the eternal realm is fullness. This is the way it is. It is revealed to such a person alone, hidden not in darkness and night, but hidden in perfect day and holy light. So we get this idea of a union. <clears throat> the bridal chamber and the bed chamber are the place where the soul marries God, where the soul becomes one with God. And during this union of soul with God, because all souls are feminine, to the one masculine God, all souls are energetically negative to the one energetically positive God. So when soul and God unite as one, that person, that soul, receives light, illumination, what is known as enlightenment. If one does not receive it while here in this place, while in this body, on this planet, living this current life, you cannot receive it in the other place. In other words, spiritual perfection and illumination only happens while you're in the body, living in this world or a world like it. A lot of people always say, oh, my grandfather became an angel. Which to them means that he's become kind of divinized or spiritualized in the afterlife. And that's just not what happened. How you die is what you're like in the afterlife. There's no magical transformation just because you die. Your soul just leaves the envelope of the body and it moves around in the afterlife. 
So dying doesn't make you enlightened, it doesn't make you one with God, it doesn't make you anything. So if you've not become one with God in the bridal chamber and received light while living, then you have to reincarnate and try again. But those who receive the light, those who are enlightened, cannot be seen or grasped. In other words, you can't identify somebody who's illumined or perfected by looking at them. And once you do identify an illumined person, you just can't grasp how they behave, how they think, how they see things. They're so far beyond our limited viewpoint until we too become illumined through the work of prayer, meditation, and selfless service. Nothing can trouble such people even while they're living in this world. Who can bother somebody that is one with God? If you're one with God, you are fearless. When they leave this world, they have already received truth through images, and the world has become the eternal realm. So they, they see this world as a heavenly place because, again, they're one with God. So when you're one with God and you see God in everyone, in everything, how can this world fail to be a divine realm? And obviously this world is always a divine realm. We just make it hell by choosing to stay in ignorance. To these illumined people, the eternal realm is fullness. In other words, it's so joyful, so blissful, so ecstatic, that there's nothing more to wish for because every desire has been fulfilled. And this is the way it is. It is revealed to such a person alone, hidden not in darkness and night, which is ignorance, but hidden in perfect day and holy light, illumination. And the mysteries of divine marriage, the bridal chamber, it's performed in the day and light, which means while living, and not at night. Night represents death. This is our goal, to become one with God, to seek God while living, and to bring everybody else with us that we can. Not by going out and knocking on doors and annoying people with pamphlets about Jesus' death, resurrection, and blah, blah, blah. But you inspire people just by smiling, by being a good human being, by radiating joy everywhere you go. And then when they say, why are you this way? You can say, you know, I practice the teachings of Mari Eshua, and that's pretty cool stuff. Oh, I'm not into the Jesus thing. Oh, neither am I. I go to this church, the Church of St. Philip, and this is how different it is. Why don't you come hang out sometime online? This concludes the beautiful teachings of the Gospel of Philip. Let's continue with the Liturgy of the Chalice.